Dune, opens its narrative on the world of Kaladin, overseen by Duke Leto Atreides. In the chambers of rest, Duke Leto's son, Paul, is asleep, observed by his mother, Jessica, and the Reverend Mother Mohaim. The elderly Reverend Mother whispers about the possibility of Paul being the Kwisatz Haderach, the catalyst for significant transformations in the universe. In order to determine Paul's humanity, the Reverend Mother subjects him to a trial involving a small box that induces intense pain. Despite the torment, Paul refrains from moving, recognizing that any such action could lead to the Gamjabar's lethal strike. His success in Mohayim's trial validates his humanity, distinguishing him from an animal. Subsequently, he learns that Jessica underwent the same test in the past, with the Reverend Mother serving as her instructor at the Bini Jesuit School. Jessica and Mohayim disclose a grim prophecy to Paul, foretelling an impending tragedy for the House of Atreides, including the demise of his father. The prophecy unfolds as a consequence of the Atreides relocating to Arrakis, a desert world now under the dominion of their adversaries, the Harkonnens. On a distant world, Baron Harkonnen discloses his scheme to his nephew, Phaedratha, and his advisor, Pider, a mantat, known for logical thinking and devoid of emotions. The Baron has manipulated the Emperor, the supreme ruler of the cosmos, into granting the desert planet Arrakis to the Atreides in exchange for the lush planet Kaladin. Despite the apparent ecological mismatch, with Arrakis being a barren desert and Kaladin a flourishing paradise, the Baron sees an advantage in this arrangement. Arrakis harbors an abundance of melange, or spice, a highly sought-after drug that serves as an addiction for millions across the galaxy. The Baron orchestrates this agreement with a sinister motive. To eliminate Duke Leto and his entire family once they set foot on Arrakis, utilizing one of their own confidants to betray them. Back to Kaladin, Reverend Mother Mohayim confronts Jessica about her decision not to bear a daughter as per the Bene Gesserit's directives. Jessica justifies her choice, explaining that the Duke strongly desired a son to serve as his heir. Mohayim criticizes her, emphasizing that without a daughter to unite with a member of House Harkonnen, the breach between the two rival houses cannot be sealed. Both women acknowledge the imminent loss of the planet Arrakis and the grim fate awaiting the Duke. Turning their attention to Paul, he recounts a dream featuring a mysterious girl who addresses him by the name Usul. Afterward, Paul encounters Thufir Hawat, the chief strategist of the Duke, within the confines of the training area. Hawat cautions Paul about the perils awaiting him on Arrakis while attempting to allay Paul's anxieties regarding the potential demise of his father. The conversation also touches upon the Fremen, the indigenous population of Arrakis, emphasizing on their tenacity and resilience, posing a challenge that the Atreides must confront. Following Hawat's departure, Gurney Halleck, the Duke's war master, emerges and initiates a training duel with Paul. Despite Paul's commendable performance, Halleck intentionally heightens the difficulty, recognizing that soon they may face genuine adversaries. Subsequently, Paul consults with Dr. Hugh, an Atreides physician, who imparts details about the life forms on Arrakis, notably the formidable sandworms that inhabit the planet. Extracting insights from the introductory biographical note and Dr. Hugh's personal reflections, it becomes apparent that he is the betrayer within the Atreides ranks. In the training room, Paul is accompanied by his father, Duke Leto, who acknowledges the impending trap orchestrated by Baron Harkonnen. Despite the perilous situation, Leto remains optimistic, asserting that the Atreides can prevail if they remain vigilant. He discloses to Paul the Harkonnen's clandestine accumulation of melange and their sinister plan to annihilate its production on Arrakis. The Harkonnen's aim to manipulate the spice's scarcity, driving its prices sky-high and securing dominance, while simultaneously implicating the Atreides for the inflated costs. In a short while, they make their way to Arrakis. 
Lady Jessica encounters her recently appointed attendant, Shadow Mapes, who belongs to the Fremen. Tasked with evaluating Jessica, the native Fremen subjects her to a test. Given her affiliation with the Bene Gesserit, an exclusive and age-old institution for women, Jessica successfully navigates the trial. She accurately recognizes an unfamiliar blade presented by Mapes, labeling it as a Chris knife. There are native individuals who view the Atreides as a beacon of hope for Arrakis, in stark contrast to the oppressive Harkonnen regime. Despite Hua's desperate attempts to keep his treacherous intentions hidden from Jessica, who possesses Bene Gesserit mental capabilities, he discloses a fragment of truth. His wife, also a member of the Bene Gesserit, was taken and presumably killed by the Harkonnens. In the confines of Paul's room, a diminutive robotic probe emerges stealthily, launching a malevolent assault on him. However, Paul skillfully evades the impending threat. Uncovering a clandestine figure beneath the palace, the Atreides troops ascertain his role in orchestrating the robotic attack. Simultaneously, Jessica stumbles upon the palace greenhouse, where a myriad of plants receives copious amounts of water daily. Amidst the lush vegetation, she discovers a missive from another member of the Bene Gesserit, Lady Finring, who alerts Jessica to the perilous plot against Paul's life and warns of a potential traitor within their midst. Despite Hawat's attempt to step down due to his perceived failure in safeguarding Paul, the Duke adamantly denies his resignation. A gathering is called for all the Duke's men, where various strategies are devised. Infiltrating the spy smugglers' network to secure their support, preparing for the anticipated Harkonnen trap, conducting a covert raid on the Harkonnen spice reserves on another planet, and enlisting the Fremen as formidable warriors against potential threats. Within this meeting, Duncan Idaho, the Sore Master, reappears alongside a Fremen leader, Stilgar. The Fremen extends an invitation to Duncan to join the siege and with the Duke's approval, Duncan agrees. Baron Harkonnen's schemes are unfolding as planned. Hawat intercepts a message that appears to be from the Baron to Lady Jessica, suggesting her involvement in a plot against Duke Leto. Despite the Duke's disbelief in the accusation, he resolves to feign susceptibility to the trap. He allows Hawat and Duncan Idaho to believe in Jessica's guilt. Among the Fremen, some are beginning to refer to Paul as Mahdi. This aligns with the prophecy predicting the arrival of their messianic savior as the offspring of a Bene Gesserit, akin to Jessica. Disclosing the Harkonnen plot to turn him against Lady Jessica, the Duke imparts the information to Paul while cautioning him against sharing it with others. The meeting between the Duke and Paul with Dr. Kynes, the ecologist of Arrakis, unfolds a surprising turn of events. Despite being ordered to betray the Atreides, Kynes is unexpectedly impressed by them. Kynes introduces the concept of still suits, specialized attire that regulates and recycles the body's moisture. Intriguingly, as Kynes interacts with Paul, he notices an uncanny alignment with the Mahdi legends. Guiding the Duke and Paul to a spice mining operation, Kynes exposes them to the intricacies of the process. Amidst their exploration, a colossal sandworm attacks the mobile spice factory. Demonstrating leadership, the Duke ensures the safety of all miners, prioritizing human lives over the valuable spice. Paul's enigmatic abilities and the Duke's compassionate concern for the workers further leave a lasting impression on Kynes. In the late hours of the night, Duke Leto contemplates an enigmatic message that has come his way. An unusual noise grabs his attention, prompting him to investigate further. To his dismay, he stumbles upon the lifeless bodies of Took and Mapes. The house generators and the protective shield have been deactivated by Hugh, rendering the Atreides castle susceptible to impending danger. In a shocking turn of events, Hugh launches an attack on Leto, disclosing a plan involving a fabricated tooth intended for the Duke. This tooth, once clenched by the Duke, 
will release a potent and lethal gas. Despite the weight of his betrayal, Hugh discloses his motive to Leto. He urges the Duke to bite down on the false tooth when presented before Baron Harkonnen, aiming to eliminate the oppressive Baron and avenge his wife's tragic demise. In a gesture of sincerity, he claims Leto's ducal ring to be passed on to Paul, symbolizing his genuine intentions for Jessica and Paul to escape unharmed. Shortly after, Jessica and Paul fall into the clutches of the Harkonnens. Transported by the guards to the desolate desert with apparent intentions to eliminate them, Jessica employs her voice to manipulate the guards into a deadly dispute, resulting in one guard slaying the other. As they break free, a small package within the vessel comes to light, containing essential supplies like food, still suits, and the ducal ring. Hugh confronts Baron Harkonnen, demanding an account of his wife's fate. As anticipated, the Baron confirms her demise and instructs Piter to execute Hugh as well. Presenting Leto before the Baron, who revels in his triumph over the defeated Duke, he presses for the whereabouts of his wife and son. In a daring move, Leto activates the poison-laden false tooth, unleashing a lethal gas that claims Piter and the guards. However, the Baron manages to evade the deadly fate. Paul and Jessica find refuge with an intent to evade the Ornithopters. Luckily, Duncan Idaho pilots one of the Ornithopter, having been aided by Hugh in escaping the Baron's pursuers. Entrusting them to safety, Duncan departs to assist the remaining surviving members of House Atreides. During this period, Paul undergoes a transformation. His intellect becomes notably detached and analytical, yet simultaneously gains formidable strength. Surpassing even his Benny Jesuit mother in foresight, Paul discloses to Jessica that the Duke always believed in her innocence. Though she mourns, he struggles to share in her grief. He experiences a sudden surge, heightened by the spice in his food, leading to a prophetic vision where he envisions numerous potential futures. Revealing a startling revelation to Jessica, he foretells her impending motherhood of a daughter, a fact unknown to anyone else. Furthermore, Paul unveils a shocking truth. Both of them share Harkonnen lineage, with the Baron being Jessica's undisclosed father. Channeling his heightened foresight, Paul comprehends his origin as a result of the Bene Gesserit's endeavors to rejuvenate the human gene pool. However, the manifestation of this revitalization is poised to be a jihad, a holy war. This conflict, spearheaded by the remaining Atreides forces and the Fremen, is destined to sweep across the galaxy. The prospect of the impending jihad unsettles Paul. Meanwhile, Hawat expresses astonishment at the extensive use of ten legions comprising Sardaukar and Harkonnen forces in the assault, a gamble that would deplete fifty years' worth of Arrakis' annual income. Hawat witnesses in Oz a group of Fremen skillfully overpower an ornithopter piloted by Sardaukar crashing it into an enemy troop carrier. A display of combat prowess and audacity unparalleled in his experience. Just as Hawat and the Fremen prepare to relocate, they are ambushed by the Harkonnen forces, leading to Hawat's capture. Paul and Jessica make a reassuring discovery as Duncan and Kynes navigate the ornithopters encircling them. They are guided to an ecological testing facility by Kynes, who reveals himself as Leet, the revered and godlike leader of the Fremen. In a negotiation between Paul and Kynes, a strategic plan unfolds. Paul aims to leverage the Fremen and their expertise to coerce the Emperor into placing the Atreides on the throne of Arrakis. Should the Emperor decline, he threatens to expose evidence to the Landsrad houses, proving the Emperor's involvement in sending Sardaukar to annihilate the Atreides. Unveiling this betrayal would unite the houses in a colossal intergalactic war against the Emperor. Kynes' facility is assaulted by the Sardaukar forces, prompting him to assist Jessica and Paul in their escape. Duncan loses his life during the intense confrontation. Seizing an ornithopter, 
Paul and Jessica elude the pursuing Harkonnen forces. To obscure their path, they venture into a sandstorm, skillfully maneuvering the aircraft to navigate the perilous winds. The captain of the Baron's guard informs him of the perceived demise of the Atreides, citing the impossibility of survival in the raging storm. Additionally, the captain suspects kinds of betrayal and relays news of Hawat's capture, prompting the Baron to devise a plan to enlist him as his personal man at. The Baron's nephew Rabin arrives on Arrakis to assume control, receiving orders to tighten his grip and enforce harsh measures to subjugate the populace. After enduring a relentless sandstorm for a duration of four hours, Paul and Jessica eventually emerge into clearer skies, relieved to find no trace of pursuing Harkonnens. Landing beside a vast rocky terrain, the duo heads towards the rocks only to witness a sandworm devouring their abandoned ornithopter. Traversing the desert landscape becomes a challenge. To evade heat exhaustion, they adopt a strategy of resting during the day and moving under the cover of night. As they reach the edge of the rocky expanse, the next part of their journey demands crossing the open desert. Jessica becomes ensnared in a sandslide, and with considerable effort, Paul manages to save his mother and retrieve the pack. Meanwhile, Gurney Halleck survives the Harkonnen assault and he encounters Stabentuk. Opting to align himself with the smuggler's enterprise, Halleck envisions leveraging this in the future against the Harkonnens. Paul and Jessica strategically deploy a thumper, a device emitting a rhythmic sound, to divert the attention of a sandworm. With caution, they traverse the desert towards the next rocky area, ensuring they maintain an irregular pace to avoid attracting the formidable creature. Upon reaching the rocky terrain, the sandworm persists in pursuing them, extending its reach over the rocks. Fortunately, a distant thumper lures the worm away, saving them from imminent danger. Upon reaching the summit of the rock zone, they are confronted by Fremen who subject them to threats. Kynes traverses the desert alone, without a still suit, abandoned by the Harkonnens to face the harsh conditions. Delirious from the heat, he envisions his deceased father, the former planetologist of Arrakis, communicating with him. In his hallucination, his father alerts him to the development of a subterranean pre-spice mass, set to erupt. This signifies a crucial stage in the growth of Melange, exploding to reach the surface and complete the Melange cycle. Recounting plans made decades ago to revolutionize Arrakis, the father details changes initiated by Kynes throughout his lifetime. Ultimately, the pre-spice mass detonates, claiming Kynes' life. Stilgar, the astute Fremen leader, identifies himself to Paul, a familiar face from his past encounters. Although ordered by Kynes to locate Paul, Stilgar harbors reservations about including Jessica in their plans. In a bold move, Jessica brandishes a knife at Stilgar, pressing it against his throat as Paul slips away. He admires Jessica's proficiency in the unique combat technique. Stilgar strikes a bargain. In exchange for teaching the Fremen this combat style, Paul and Jessica can reside among them. Among the Fremen is Cheney, Kynes' daughter, the girl from Paul's dreams. Stilgar leads them to a Fremen stronghold, emphasizing the importance of not challenging his authority. He discloses the Fremen's plan to bribe the guild with spice to prevent Harkonnen surveillance and their dream of transforming Arrakis into a lush paradise. Jessica learns of their unique mode of transportation, riding sandworms. Recognizing the need for Jessica and Fremen society, Stilgar mentions the potential replacement of their aging reverend mother and cites the prophecy that the Bene Gesserit's son holds the key to their future. In a trance, Jessica delivers a captivating vision, earning acceptance as a possible future reverend mother, concealing her pregnancy. Paul reluctantly agrees to a deadly duel with Jamie's, showcasing his combat skills but regretting the necessity. Following a duel, Paul earns respect from the Fremen, 
Stilgar gives him the name Usul, but Paul adopts Muad Dib, inspired by a mouse on Arrakis. At Jamie's funeral, water from the fallen warrior is offered to Paul, symbolizing honor. Cheney asks him to play a love song, causing tension with Jessica, who foresees Paul's involvement in a future jihad. Meanwhile, on the Harkonnen homeworld, Phaedrotha manipulates a gladiatorial duel, impressing Lady Fenring. The scheme involves a hypnotically implanted secret word making his opponent vulnerable. Phaedrotha wins as Count and Lady Fenring discuss plans for her to seduce him and continue the Bene Gesserit genetic program. Paul and Jessica are guided by the Fremen to Siege Tabor, the dwelling of Stilgar and his group of Fremen followers. Upon arrival, they learn of the demise of Kynes, the Fremen's leader. Hara, the wife of Jamie's, now pledged to marry or serve Paul, introduces him to the Siege. Paul accepts Hara as a servant, but not as a wife. The tribe faces the imminent need to abandon the Siege as they are pursued by the Sardaukar. Despite the impending departure, life carries on, with children attending classes and workers organizing programs, including a plan for a network of due collectors to function in their absence. A ceremony is held to welcome Jessica into the clan as their new reverend mother, replacing the one on the brink of death. As part of the ritual, Jessica is obligated to consume a peculiar liquid from a sack. Drawing upon her Bene Gesserit abilities, she transforms the poison into a harmless substance. The liquid undergoes a chemical reaction, rendering it safe for her to ingest. During the ongoing ceremony, she experiences a sense of confinement within herself. The departing Reverend Mother approaches Jessica, embraces her, and allows her spirit to merge with Jessica's body and mind. Along with the spirit comes the entire history of the Bene Gesserit and humanity, spanning thousands of years. Simultaneously, the unborn child within Jessica is inundated with these memories and awareness, with only hers love preventing the child from succumbing to insanity. Instructing the Fremen to drink from the sack, Jessica encourages them to embrace the heightened awareness offered by the liquid reminiscent of Melange. Cheney leads Paul away, and they are presumed to share an intimate moment. Two years later, Baron Harkonnen storms through his exclusive chambers, vigorously searching for his captain of the guard. A young servant, previously favored by the Baron, attempts to assassinate him, and he concludes that his nephew is behind the plot. Swiftly discerning the identity of the informants within his guard, he issues immediate orders for their execution. Confronting Phaedrotha, the Baron admonishes him for the ill-conceived attempt on his life. His nephew decides to bide his time, curious about his uncle's intentions regarding the Emperor. The Baron engages in a meeting with Hawat, who has requested a message be sent to Rabin, the Baron's nephew on Arrakis, without divulging the reason. Hawat unveils his suspicion that Salissa Secundus serves as the training ground for the formidable Sardaukar forces employed by the Empire. He theorizes that the Emperor orchestrated the destruction of the House of Atreides due to the formidable skills of Duke Leto's forces nearly on par with the Sardaukar. Hawat points out the harshness of Arrakis as a training ground, asserting that the Fremen surpassed the Sardaukar in combat prowess. Recalling a past suggestion to Count Finring about using Arrakis as a prison planet, the Baron contemplates Hawat's proposal to abandon support for Rabin, compelling him to intensify oppression. On the arid plains of Arrakis, Paul is readying himself for his inaugural sandworm ride. Over the past two years, the Fremen have hailed him as a religious seer, a dual role that positions him both as a spiritual figure and a political leader. Encircled by the formidable Fidakin, highly skilled guards, trained to the highest standards, Paul's status among the Fremen raises concerns for Jessica, now the newly appointed Reverend Mother. Amid these developments, she gives birth to Alia, Paul's sister. Meanwhile, Cheney, 
having born a child from her unofficial union with Paul, names their son Leto after Paul's own father. The acceptance of Alia among the Fremen proves challenging as she absorbed the memories of the Bene Gesserit during her mother's spice drug-induced pregnancy. Remarkably intelligent from birth, at the tender age of two, she already communicates in coherent, adult-like sentences and walks with ease. Exiting his tent, Paul encounters Stilgar, who provides him with a thumper to summon the sandworm. Equipped with hooks and poles by fellow Fremen, Paul activates the thumper, heralding the approach of a colossal worm. Meanwhile, far away in the southern reaches of Arrakis, Jessica finds refuge in the safety of the siege. Hara, accompanied by the enigmatic Alia, expresses her unease regarding the child, whose mature demeanor raises suspicions among Fremen mothers, branding her as either a witch or possessed. Back in the northern expanse, Paul successfully masters the sandworm summoned by the thumper. Stilgar suggests a halt for the night, realizing the brewing discontent among the young men eager for Paul to challenge his leadership. Amidst their deliberations, a smuggler ornithopter violates Fremen territory, prompting Paul to devise a harsh measure to safeguard their domain. Gurney Halleck, Paul's former mentor, orchestrates the operation. Paul discloses his true identity to Halleck, who reaffirms his loyalty to the young Duke. Guiding Halleck into a concealed Fremen cavern, they are ambushed as the purported smugglers reveal themselves to be Sardaukar, the Emperor's troops. Despite the surprise attack, the Fremen eliminate all but a handful of them, suffering minimal losses. Paul instructs the Fremen to apprehend the surviving Sardaukar, but secretly plans for their escape, intending for them to convey the Fremen's prowess to the Harkonnens and the Emperor. Opting not to challenge Stilgar, Paul gains acceptance not only as useful of the Fremen, but also as the Duke of Arrakis. Meanwhile, Halleck is astonished to learn that Paul's mother is alive. He had believed she was the one who betrayed the Atreides to the Harkonnens. Addressing a sizable gathering of Fremen, Paul resists their attempts to provoke a conflict with Stilgar, asserting his intelligence and avoiding such a confrontation. Instead, he embraces his religious role as Muad'Dib, the prophetic leader. He informs the Fremen that Rabin, the Harkonnen ruler of Arrakis, has been cut off from Baron Harkonnen's support, presenting an opportunity for them to seize control. Embracing Paul's new role, the Fremen stand ready for an imminent and formidable battle. Later, Paul escorts his mother to his chambers, introducing Halleck to her. Suddenly, Halleck launches an attack, suspecting her of betraying the Atreides. With a knife at her throat, he threatens to end her life, but Paul manages to convince him of her innocence. Overwhelmed with remorse, Halleck pleads with Paul to end his life, but Paul refuses. Next, Paul ventures to the location where the spice drug is produced by small sandworms, deciding to ingest the spice drug, mimicking his mother's ritual. After three weeks, Jessica summoned Chaney from the southern regions, as Paul has been in a trance all this time. Jessica has exhausted all efforts to aid him and has summoned Chaney on a whim. Recognizing that Paul consumed some of the spice drug, Chaney urges Jessica to quickly convert a portion of the drug into a safe form for administration. Just then, Paul awakens, having altered the drug himself. Seizing Jessica's hand, he demands to be shown the inner place where you cannot enter, a realm untouched by any reverend mother. Paul then speaks of two ancient forces, one that bestows and one that seizes, the former embodying the primary force of women and the latter of men. He claims that only he can harmonize these forces. Paul elaborates on his vision of a massive fleet hovering above Arrakis, poised to pillage the desert planet. Beyond the rocky barrier of Arrakis, numerous vessels make landfall. The arrival is marked by the presence of the Emperor, Baron Harkonnen, and five legions of Sardaukar. Stilgar and Paul strategize to await the onset of a formidable sandstorm, 
during which they planned to breach the shield wall. Following this, the Fremen intend to disable the spaceships, preventing their departure. Subsequently, the Fremen will launch an assault on the Sardaukar, while the inhabitants of Arrakis rebel against the Emperor and his forces. With the Sandstorm in full force, Halleck demolishes the shield wall. However, as Paul and his troops gear up for a confrontation with the Sardaukar, distressing news arrives from Siege Tavern. The settlement has been raided, resulting in numerous casualties, including Paul's son Lido. Furthermore, Alia has been taken captive. Cheney and Jessica, fortunately, were not present during the attack as they were in hiding closer to the city. Simultaneously, within the Emperor's ship, just prior to the shield being breached, discussions unfold between the Baron, the Emperor, Phaedrotha, and Rabin. Alia, held captive by the Emperor's men, is presented to the assembly. The Emperor expresses fury over the escape of only a few Sardaukar from the hands of elderly individuals, women, and children, attributing this to the exceptional combat skills of the Fremen. The Emperor's true heir, Reverend Mother Mohayim, labels Alia as an abomination, possessing the memories of all past Reverend Mothers and infiltrating Mohayim's mind. As the Emperor threatens Paul, the Fremen launch their attack, shattering the shield wall. Alia eliminates the Baron, her grandfather, with her Gamjabar, and makes her escape. Reports reach the Emperor that the Fremen have breached the shields of his ships. In disbelief, the Emperor and his troops witness the Fremen approaching on massive sandworms. The Sardaukar are swiftly defeated, and Paul reassumes his position. He sends a Sardaukar captive as a messenger to the Emperor for surrender negotiations. Despite his victory, Paul harbors concerns about the impending Jihad, acknowledging his role as the Kwisatz Haderach. Cheney and Jessica make their entrance, closely followed by the Emperor. Paul summons Hawat to step forward, but little does he know that the Baron has administered him lethal poison, bringing him to the brink of death. In a sinister twist, Hawat, although on the verge of demise, is handed a poisonous needle by the Emperor to assassinate Paul. However, he refuses and passes away in Paul's embrace. Facing a threat from the Emperor to unleash the House of Landsrad ships against the Fremen, Paul counters by commanding the representatives of the Spacing Guild to compel the ships to withdraw. Paul issues a dire warning that, should they resist, he will eradicate all the spice on Arrakis, thereby depriving everyone of their crucial supply. The guildsmen comply with Paul's demands, leaving the Emperor powerless. In a bold move, Phaedrotha challenges Paul to a duel. Despite his customary cheating, Paul emerges victorious, dealing the fatal blow. Attempting to eliminate Paul, the Emperor seeks the assistance of Count Fenring. To the his dismay, Fenring refuses to attack. Seizing the opportunity, Paul proposes marriage to Princess Irulan, the Emperor's daughter, to ascend to the throne. Although reluctantly agreed upon by the Emperor, Cheney negotiates the terms, with Paul assuring her that, despite Irulan's title as royal concubine, Cheney will be his true wife. 